You're watching Saturday Anime on the Sci-Fi Channel. Greetings, this is Reverend Paul, and this is Studio Chojin Raw. And once again, I am joined by uh, Fairly. Fairly, how are you doing today? I'm all right, how are you? I'm doing well. Today, we are going to talk about Angel's Egg. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, so, Angel's Egg is an OVA. It came out uh, December 15th, 1985. It was written and directed by Mamaru Oshi. And Mamaru Oshi is probably best known to people as the director of the 1995 Ghost in the Shell movie. And he directed Ghost in the Shell Innocence. I believe he also directed the uh, Yuritsei Yatsura movie. And he's an interesting filmmaker. He's a filmmaker like Satoshi Kon, where he uses a lot of symbols and metaphors in his films. It's a beautiful film. And it is very interestingly done. I have to admit, I didn't know what I was getting into when I <laughs> started watching this. It's done very poetically, so I definitely appreciated it. Was it was a visual journey? Let's put it that way. Beautiful to watch. I feel like Angel's Egg is kind of like the '80s version of Belladonna of Sadness. I could see that. Yeah, I mean, so I'd only heard of Angel's Egg in the context of Yoshitaka Mano before, and I love his illustrations. I love his illustration style. I don't necessarily think it translates the best to animation. Even like Vampire Hunter D, like you can see how he has this very lush illustration style that kind of obviously needs to be simplified for it to work visually animated. So it does have this really incredible visual style in common, at least with Belladonna, in the sense that it looks more like a painting in a lot of the scenes. And they also do rely on a lot of, I don't want to say still images because they are minimally animated, but a lot of scenes that are more or less static to really drive home that plot and elaborate on the visual world that you're in. There's that one scene later on in the film where it almost feels like a loading screen where the girl is sleeping and the guy's just sitting there like the video game is loading waiting for like the <laughs> the environment to build and then he stands up and like he picks up his sword like okay we're ready to go now yeah that i could definitely see that there was actually a moment where my internet connection is terrible so i really thought that maybe i had just like the sound was still going and <laughs> visual was not until i was like oh wait no the candles are flickering this is still working <laughs> it's also fair to describe angel's egg as kind of an 80s version of Belladonna of Sadness because it is a beautiful avant-garde movie that stars a young woman, but it has that 80s vibe in the sense that it's set in the post-apocalypse and every third movie that came out in the 80s always took place in the post-apocalypse. That's a fair assessment. So Angel's Egg basically tells the story of a young girl who one day she wakes up and she has an egg and then she basically takes her egg and then she starts wandering around this post-apocalyptic wasteland. Is that the story? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's where the movie begins, right? Right. Yeah. No. I. I <laughs> there's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot of moments in this movie where I kind of just went, "What the hell am I watching right now?" Yes, she has this egg. Whether or not she wakes up with it or just has been tending to it for a long time is kind of the impression that I got watching it. She carries it around with her under her dress, obviously in the intent to hatch it, as she kind of scavenges for resources, I was guessing, between the water and the food and all this other stuff in this really desolate, wasted city. It's beautiful still. That's the amazing thing is that even though it's a post-apocalyptic wasteland, it's still beautiful and has this very kind of decadent atmosphere to it, despite the fact that everything is broken down and or biomechanically altered. It's really interesting to look at. And I love that opening sequence where she's getting ready to leave or she's getting dressed and that score is playing and that to me especially with Amano's character designs like that to me actually feels like this is what a Vampire Hunter D movie should be and there's this reoccurring theme in the movie where I guess it's it's a trope of Oshis where the girl is constantly going to water she's constantly filling up this jug yeah the jugs of water seem to be a little bit obsessive even towards the end you can see that the steps up to that chamber that she ends up sleeping in which we can assume that she's been living in this place is littered with, and I shouldn't say littered, it's actually very neatly organized, um, st 
stacked with these same circular jugs of water all the way up, which there is a lot of symbolism to kind of be unpacked there as well. It's one of the few seemingly purely organic substances in the movie. Everything else, like I said, seems to have been very biomechanically altered or like straight up man-made. And water has a very rich tradition of symbolizing human intuition and emotionality. And this is, I think, one of the establishing characteristics of this character. There's like no dialogue in this film. There's some dialogue, but it's very, very sparse. So we can't really tell who these people are through their dialogue or what they're saying. So the fact that she's really meticulous about collecting water and drinking water and bringing water to her home, I think says a lot about who she is as a character, considering. And then as she's kind of traveling through this wasteland, she comes upon these giant penis tanks. Is it me or do those tanks look like <laughs> giant penises? <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, uh, it was... Very Giger-esque, except masculine. You know, Giger does a lot with the feminine tropes and a lot like monster women and whatever. These were very phallic. A dude pops out out of one of these penis tanks and then he kind of like just follows the girl and then she is kind of apprehensive about this dude. But then there's this sequence where it's almost like she's falling in love with him, where it becomes this very Yoshitaka Mano, like flowy hair. It almost looks like the cover of one of his art books. Yeah, they have an interesting dynamic. This is actually part of what I was uncertain about the first time I watched it. I watched this twice because I wanted to kind of unpack especially this dynamic a little bit better. And I'm not sure that I can, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> because you're right, there is a lot of almost tension between them. And yet, it's very innocent. She is clearly a child, and there is kind of this innocent wonder it makes you suspect that maybe she's never seen a man before. Maybe she's only ever existed completely on her own. But the fact that she carries this egg around under her dress and she spends a lot of the movie walking around looking like she's pregnant, incubating this egg, and then has this very interesting dynamic of like wonder and almost, I, I don't want to say romance because it's not like steamy or anything. It's just like, yeah, kind of a, a curious obsession makes me wonder if there is part of the theme here being this the moment that innocence is lost or that capturing of feminine curiosity that occurs maybe with like that first love experience. I think that's kind of what the movie is about. Spoilers for anybody who doesn't want this very old avant-garde movie spoiled for them. At the end of the movie where he smashes the egg with his crucifix gun, I took that to basically mean the smashing of innocence. You know, if you want to look at the crucifix as religion or whether you want to look at it as society, this is the man crushing innocence. Well, it's very interesting because that's definitely how I read it at first. And then there were a few things that made me question if maybe it was a little bit more than that. And perhaps that innocence is actually more about belief than it is about an actual, I don't, again, I don't want to say sexual experience because this is not, I don't think this is a movie about sex or even like a coming of age story, really. It can be read that way. And I do think that is part of what makes it interesting in the sense that love is something that we believe in. And certainly, you know, I was a little girl once and, you know, <laughs> You, you put a lot of faith into the idea of your first love. And then when that turns out to not be what you expect, your faith is kind of shattered. You do have this crisis around that. But I do think that this movie might be more about the overarching theme of a crisis of faith, whether that's first love or religion. I actually read something just very briefly, because there's not a whole lot of information about this movie available at a cursory search, that the director had been Christian at some point, apparently seemingly for quite a stretch, actually, and had a crisis of faith somewhat just before making this movie. So a lot of people suggest that this might actually be about his crisis with the church itself. I think there's a lot of merit to that point of view. Midway through the story, the guy tells the girl the story about Noah's Ark. 
But he tells her an alternate version where the dove doesn't come back and Noah and all the animals, they wait for the dove and they wait so long they end up turning to stone. And then at the end of the movie, I guess the reveal, the twist at the end is that the world is Noah's Ark. And also in the film, there's also a fossil of a giant dead bird. My reading of the movie, Oshi is basically saying the world is collectively Noah's Ark waiting for the dove. You know, we're waiting for hope that's never coming because that dove is dead. <laughs> you know, that dove is dead and is never coming back. We are all basically fucked. Well, yes. I mean, again, ultimately, if you're watching all of the visual cues there, that's probably the point you're going to arrive at. What I find most interesting, though, is that for someone who seems to be saying, making the statement, and for someone who supposedly had his own crisis at the same point in time, he does still hold on to a lot of hope. And I say that because, like, for example, when she first meets the man, she's eating food that she scavenged, 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 I, I don't remember there's an N in that word or not, anyway. She's eating food, and he startles her, and he's holding her egg, and she gets obviously very flustered and confused as to why he has her egg, and he says to her, keep precious things inside you, or someone might take them. At first, again, I was reading this as kind of like a purity allegory, like an innocence allegory, and I was just like, hmm, that's a bold statement about virginity. And then as I kind of let myself relax a little bit, um, I realized that this egg is her hope. This is her faith that the world is not just a frozen, stony, decaying place. There's the scene with the fishermen, and they're chasing the shadows of these massive fish through the water. And then as the scene progresses, they leave the water and you see their shadows on buildings and in through the city. And it's very clear that these fish are not real. And even one or the other of them, I, I honestly can't remember who's the girl that points it out or the, I think it's the girl that points it out first that says they're chasing something that doesn't exist. The fish aren't there, but they chase them anyway. And at the end, when she plunges into the water and she actually kind of becomes an adult through this process, the bubbles that rise to the surface in this very Hans Christian Andersen moment are the egg. There's just countless eggs. And it's as if even though she has lost her faith and has now seen that there is no warmth coming through the efforts that she has put out, there is still hope there. Someone will still have hope. There's still faith rising from this moment somehow, some way. So even though, yes, the world is Noah's Ark and it's dead and it's stony and she in the end seemingly is reduced to just a stone idol, one of many on the ship, there is still some hope there somewhere. Well, I don't think there is any hope because there's nothing in the egg. The whole idea is that it's a false sense of hope and that false sense of hope gets smashed by the big cross, however, whatever you want to take that to mean. I would argue that it doesn't matter because her egg was empty. Yes, all the eggs are probably empty, but the act of carrying that egg gave her a purpose. And I think the fact that the eggs, again, you see the eggs rise in the end from the water. The promise of hope is a lot. And I, I mean, again, it is a very cynical film. Like if you're, again, if you're reading it totally literally, it's like, oh shit, everything's empty and why do we bother? But I still think the fact that there is even empty hope, like that hope still means something. And I think that's important. I can see what you're saying. I think there is something to the idea that hope is intangible. You can't break open an egg and see hope. Hope is an idea and it's something you believe inside you. You can take it to mean that because the guy keeps telling the girl to break open the egg to see what's inside and she doesn't. It's almost as if he's telling her like, look inside the egg because there's nothing there. And she's almost saying, I choose to believe there is something there. Right, and when he says to her, keep precious things inside you, it's an interesting statement considering the next question he asks her is, what's in the egg? So a lot of the film to me, at the end at least, after watching it and thinking about it, was more about what we do to ourselves when we expose our beliefs 
beliefs, our hopes, our faith to other people and what happens when people question it and break it apart. It actually makes me wonder how exactly the crisis of faith played out in Oishi's life um, because it seems as if maybe the questioning of others has a lot to do with the way that we lose these precious things and what is more precious than hope. That is true. I wrote down my interpretation when I was very high. You want to hear oh. what my interpretation of the movie is when I was high? Yeah, definitely. Okay. The world is Noah's Ark waiting for a dove, but the dove is dead and not coming back. And there are people who have a vested interest in not bringing the dove back. The Cold War is a ghost that is still haunting us, <laughs> you know, and the US and Russia are engaged in a giant prick waving contest to see who has the bigger dick. And religion is a killer disguised as a protector, <laughs> essentially. I mean, it's... It, it's interesting. I don't know how deep I can get into that because I don't really know where Japan would stand on that. Um, <laughs> but it's funny because I've been going through a lot of 80s media lately, specifically music. I definitely have combed my archives for... There's some great 80s songs about nuclear warfare. Let me just say that. But it's funny how relevant a lot of 80s media is thematically right now, considering some of the tensions that we're dealing with in 2022. But Japan, I know for a lot of classic anime does deal with the idea of World War II being this gigantic shadow hanging over society as a whole. So I wouldn't really be surprised if those fish and the clear military involvement in this film were still part of that. Certainly the 80s, there was a low level paranoia, maybe not even a low level, a high level paranoia. <laughs> about, you know, massive warfare again. So I wouldn't be surprised if that was part of it. I guess I took the fish again to be a little more religious because fish are such a classic symbol of Christianity. And once I knew the director's background with the church, it was a little difficult to look away from the reading of the fish as Christ. But there's also that massive fish carcass that they walk through at some point, I think on the way to see the bird skeleton and that just that red very Leviathan to me. So that, but again, Leviathan's also a governmental metaphor. Look at Thomas Hobbes. I feel like I talk about Thomas Hobbes every single day lately, and I don't know when this became my life. Um, but anyway, so yeah, you know, honestly though, I mean, isn't that apt? We could look at a lot of the same metaphors as religion or government, and ultimately probably one in the same. I don't think they're mutually exclusive. The soldiers could serve as a Cold War metaphor and the fish could also serve as a religious metaphor. And even though the Cold War was a conflict between the United States and Russia, Japan had a unique interest in the Cold War because they're the only country that has ever been attacked by an atomic bomb. So, I mean, mm. even though they weren't caught up in the arms race, they knew what the stakes of that race were, which is why every anime that comes out like from 1960 to 1990 is about the bomb. And I feel like you do have some of that going on here. Yeah, and I mean, certainly if you look at the setting of the film, it looks apocalyptic. You could definitely believe that this is post-nuclear warfare territory. If you want to look at like a literal reading of the film, let's try to come up with some kind of like literal reading that actually makes sense. I actually think you can almost interpret the film as saying that the guy and the girl, they're ghosts that are just living out this cycle of carrying this egg. They're the remnants of civilization that have been destroyed by nuclear war. And even the guy says when he's telling her that Noah's Ark story, he's questioning whether he even really exists because he can't remember certain things about his past. Yeah, they do say at some point that they speculate on whether they are the memory of that bird just dreaming. Is the bird the dove from Noah's Ark or do you think the bird is like an angel manifested in corporeal form? Well, it looked to me like there were some humanoid elements on that bird skeleton, which the moment of reveal where they're talking about the bird and the girl says to him like, I've seen this bird, I know this bird, come see, like come this way and she leads him to this skeleton. They're does seem to be a moment where he seems very surprised that this thing even exists. Like he really was expecting it to be a fairy tale altogether. So I think maybe the answer is both. 
perhaps the dove in the story was some sort of angel. The other question is, what are we really watching? Are we watching literal reality play out? Are we watching a little girl's dream? Are we watching an angel's dream? Like, what are we seeing here? Which I think would determine what that skeleton is. It didn't look totally like a bird to me, so question mark? I think there's several ways to read this film, depending on where you're at in life, what substances you are on while you're watching this. <laughs> um, I can't pretend I didn't really want to watch this high, but we'll save that for another life phase, I guess. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting, and it's very beautiful to watch, too. And I think that this is probably one that each time you see it, you're going to see something different. I watched it twice, but I would definitely watch it again and just try to pick up maybe something else and see if there is another way to read it because I think that there is several. No, I agree. I mentioned before a recurring theme is water and water is something Oshi uses a lot in his films. I mean, Ghost in the Shell has plenty of water scenes. There's even a scene in this movie that is right out of Ghost in the Shell or rather, you know, this inspired that scene in Ghost in the Shell. I feel like there's this kind of twofold interpretation of the water where water classically is the symbol of life but then this movie is meant to sort of be almost like a sequel to Noah's Ark and the water in Noah's Ark is destruction. Water bookends the movie where she begins the movie drinking the water and she has this kind of like vision. And I think in the beginning, the water is very much a nurturing force. But then by the time we get to the end of the movie, the water becomes destruction. Well, it certainly is her destruction. But again, if we want to go back to the reading of this as a story of the loss of innocence, when she dives into the water, presumably to drown. What we see is her meeting her adult self, and the adult self is what sinks to the bottom. So the water is a destruction in the sense that it is a destruction of her innocence and a destruction of her youthful belief. But at the same time, it also does usher her into whatever this other life phase is, even if we're not going to see that play out because presumably she's dead. It does initiate her into adulthood, which is also kind of an interesting take on the whole baptism symbolism. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> there's, a, there's another thing we can <laughs> look at as metaphor here. Yeah, I mean, I guess to some degree, maybe you could look at the movie as this a young girl coming into adulthood, the death of childish things, if you want to look at the egg as that, you know, whether it's naivete or childish hope or whatever, like it's almost as if her child self dies and then she is born as a woman. Yeah, we could look at it that way. And that's certainly how I started reading it again when I first watched it, because it does seem like perhaps this egg is the idea of life that you nurture for yourself as a young person going through life with this big, bright, innocent, not that anything in this film is bright, but you know, this very innocent viewpoint on things. But I did kind of abandon that somewhere around midway through because it definitely seems like that might be too sensitive a reading of femininity for this movie. And even though it is beautiful and it is very interesting both to watch and to think about, I do think it's more universal than strictly the feminine experience experience. To kind of bring it back to comparing it to Belladonna, Belladonna is absolutely about the feminine experience, even though it was written by a male French historian, he was specifically reading it as kind of the plight of women in Europe during the Middle Ages. So that was literally about, <laughs> about the feminine experience, where I think this is really more about the loss of faith, whether that happens through growing up and having to lose your innocence and your faith in childish things, or through realizing that the legends that you've believed your whole life might not actually be true. There's a lot of rude awakenings that we could relate this to, and I think it is more universal than a woman's coming-of-age story. What is interesting also, I was reading an interview with Mamaru Oshi, and he was saying that a lot of these ideas in Angel's Egg, they were originally supposed to be for a Lupin the Third movie. And then he described the movie, which sounds really interesting, where it was going to be about this tower that a young girl lived 
lives in. And then there's a murder in there. And then Lupin goes to the tower to discover the mystery of the murder. And then it turns out the young girl living in the tower is actually an angel. And all the clues that she's an angel is that there are all these feathers that are floating around. You see that a lot in this movie too, where there's the remains of the feathers floating around everywhere, which is, I guess that's the remains of the decaying bird. That would be a weird Lupin the Third movie. <laughs> um, but... <laughs> I want to see I, it though. It sounds really interesting. <laughs> 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 that would be so strange um i would watch it it's it's weird though <laughs> but actually and and that's something that i also kind of read into there when i was saying that like all the bubbles that bubble to the surface they look like eggs and i took that as still hope bubbles up whether it's empty or not it might just be pockets of gas but it still bubbles up and isn't that beautiful in a way there are still feathers everywhere so that to me also seemed very much like a symbol of that lingering hope even if it is quite desolate and what we're seeing are feathers that are swirling around him as he's watching this ship full of stone idols rising from the sea, it still feels somewhat hopeful. Even the fact that perhaps once upon a time there was an angel, or even a giant bird, whatever it is, is quite beautiful and should instill some sense of wonder or curiosity in anybody. I'm with you. I mean, one thing I think that's worth pointing out is the fact the ending of the film echoes the beginning where we see the young girl waking up. But like you were saying, when she dies, she releases all those eggs and you get the feeling, especially since the ending is echoing the beginning, that this story is cyclical. This is almost something that's happening over and over again. So this idea that like hope is not dead because it's, it's there, <laughs> you know, it's constantly happening. It's just constantly being crushed. So all it takes is to break the cycle. It's not that there is no hope. It's just that hope is not being given the opportunity to flourish. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's why I don't necessarily see the film as ultimately irredeemably cynical. And I do think there is a certain optimism to it. Even looking at that bird skeleton. And like I said, he does seem to be somewhat surprised that it even exists. That he maybe was expecting this not to be what it actually ends up being. And now there's all these feathers. There's more going on here than this character would have told the girl there was. And I think that it's building on something. So perhaps the cycle does get broken. Perhaps it would take all those dozens more eggs to do so, but maybe at some point it will. You do get the feeling too that he is trapped also because he doesn't get on that spaceship. He watches it leave. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting almost to do a sequel to this movie where you put him in the role of the girl, where somebody destroys whatever hope or whatever thing is keeping him going. Well, when I was watching that ending, I was raised Catholic <laughs> and I could not get away from the visual style of these statues on the ship looking very much like how you see the saints depicted in a lot of Catholic architecture and church iconography. And the fact that now she is represented on this ship in stone holding her egg, it read very much like a depiction of martyrdom and certainly drowning herself out of faith for what she had, what she lost. There are weirder stories of saints out there. Weirder things have martyred people in the past. I definitely read that into it as well. And the fact that he very stoically stands on shore and watches the ship with these seemingly idols on it led me to wonder if perhaps his story is that of the cynic who is irredeemable, that he doesn't see these tales of faith, however they turn out, as anything to be marveled at, which is maybe the only way to truly be lost. Maybe the only way to truly kill hope is to remove all sense of wonder and curiosity and just very emotionlessly watch this play out and have no reaction as he seems to. No, that makes sense to me. I can see that. When you start looking at the dude as kind of like a stand-in for like the cynic, it does become interesting that the cross becomes his tool to destroy hopes and dreams. Yeah. Well, but notice that it was also kind of destroyed to begin with. Perhaps he was a believer and his own hope was destroyed and now he needs to destroy the hope of all others. I could see that. Yeah. I think we figured this movie out. <laughs>
I think we're doing pretty good. So now when people Google Angel's Egg, what the hell did I just watch? Here it is. Here's what you just watched, guys. Exactly. I, I feel like, you know, in terms of avant-garde movies, I think this is accessible. I actually think Belladonna of Sadness is less accessible than this. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think that Belladonna is... I can follow much more of a distinct plot line in that. There seems to be a story set up from the beginning that kind of just throws you into it, where, like, there's a good 15 minutes in this film of just watching a girl carrying an egg around a ruined city going, what is ha- what's gonna happen with this? Is this going somewhere? So I think maybe people who think that this is just an inaccessible art house avant-garde piece of whatever, probably I would venture to guess it's more about the attention span. This does unfold very slowly. So if you're looking to be grabbed instantly, don't. <laughs> you know, this unfolds. This is a slow burn. You gotta get into it. Could be because I was, you know, I was very high when I watched the movie. It was always interesting <laughs> to me. But like, you know, it's it's got that, you know, it has that 80s post-apocalyptic feel. It's got all these sci-fi elements to it. I mean, it doesn't have any action, but it's definitely got all the visuals there. I could definitely see some people, maybe they're turned off by the visual style of Belladonna of Sadness because it is so abstract. This is a little bit more like traditional anime. Yes, that that is absolutely true. If you like you some 80s anime, this is definitely gonna be up your alley. There are some very interesting animation sequences, certainly like the designs are by Yoshitaka Amano. You know there's something coming with hair at some point, but it is a straightforward anime. It's not going to be like, you know, there's no watercolor mats and just static images of orgies happening like in Belladonna. This is definitely an anime. So did you like Angel's Egg? What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, I, I definitely... It was a little tough to enter into at first, but I think it's because I was looking a little too hard at it right away. I was instantly in analysis mode, but that's because I went to art school and I assume that if something takes that long to start, I'm already missing something. So again, once I relaxed and let myself actually just watch it, it's beautiful and it's very interesting and it's worth turning over all of those different ideas about what what could be happening and even more interestingly how it might relate to your own life or experiences that you've had because there's probably I would venture to guess for most people if you look hard enough a personal connection that could really help you enter into this and stay engaged it's very interesting I enjoyed it I'd watch it again I think the longer you sit with it and this also could be something you want to watch with either a group of people or like I I don't know if there's like a book club version for movies or whatever, but like discuss it because I think everyone watching this will likely come at this from a slightly different place. This week's question comes from Lowell, and Lowell writes, How goes things with you? Just wanted to give you a what's up from beyond the comments section of your awesome YouTube channel. Also, I have two questions for you. What's your thoughts on the lack of armor anime over the last few years? I swear the days of Giver, Tekaman Blade, and Exilion feel like a distant memory. And number two, have you ever read or seen Bastard? It's got a fantastic OVA, killer manga with gorgeous art, and of course the Netflix series is very fun. Hope you can cover it someday. Thank you, 
you, Lowell, for uh, those kind words, and uh, thank you for sending me a question. The 80s did seem like a special time for armored anime, and there certainly aren't any anime like Giver or Tekaman around today. But with that said, I don't think any genre in anime truly dies. And I think if you're looking for like cool armored suit action, there's still plenty of fun to be had. I think Tiger and Bunny is a really fun show that has a lot of cool like armored suit action. And I actually think that the Netflix Ultraman show is very Giver like There's that one episode where Seiji cuts that fucking monster in half and the blood spurts all over the place and Seiji's Ultraman suit gets covered in blood and then you see the two halves of the monster on the floor twitching. That struck me as a very Giver-esque moment. And I think if you have an itch to see dudes in cool armored suits beating the shit out of monsters in violent ways, I think the Netflix Ultraman show will definitely give you your fix. But with that said, I would love to see a new Tekaman series. I would love to see a new Giver series. There's so much cool action that happens in the Giver manga that we have not seen on screen yet. And speaking of Ultraman, I mean, the later chapters of the Giver pretty much turn into Ultraman, where we have full on giant kaiju fighting in cities. It's fucking awesome. I would love to see that in anime. So I'm totally with you. While I do think there's still plenty of like armored action to be had with modern anime, I definitely would love to see the Giver come back. I would definitely love to see Tekaman come back. And yes, I have read the Bastard manga. I've seen the animes. I think the Netflix show for Bastard is really great. I'm planning on making a video on it very soon. The thing that I love about Bastard, there are a lot of animes that have great action. There's a lot of animes that have great gore. And there's a lot of animes that have great fan service. But there are very few animes that are great at doing all three things. And Bastard is one of those shows that I think it does all of those things exceptionally well. Bastard has great action. It has great fan service. And it has great gore scenes. Dark Snyder is a fucking badass dude. He goes, Venom! And then he fucking eviscerates a dude into mush. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> it is so cool. The action sequences in Bastard get really ridiculous. I love the bevy of hot chicks that are always throwing themselves at Dark Snyder. It's a very cool series. And um, I'm looking forward to talking about it more. And thank you, Lowell, for sending me a question. I hope that answered your question. If you'd like to ask me a question, you could send me an email at studiochojin at gmail.com. Make the subject raw. And I will be happy to read it on a future edition of this show. So that wraps up this week's edition of Studio Chojin Raw. I hope you enjoyed the program. I think Angel's Egg is a really cool anime. It's certainly not going to be for everybody, but I think if you engage with it, there's a lot of interesting ideas to be had. And if you are interested in more experimental anime like Angel's Egg, I would recommend you check out Belladonna of Sadness, which is an anime me and Fairly have discussed on this channel before. And I would also recommend checking out Yoshitaka Mano's A Thousand and One Nights. I think that makes a very good companion piece to uh, Angel's Egg. And A Thousand and One Nights is probably the closest you're ever going to get to seeing Yoshitaka Amano's artwork come to life. And I'm pretty sure that whole short film is on YouTube somewhere if you want to check it out. So with that said, I want to thank you for checking out this video. And I want to encourage you, if you haven't already, to subscribe to Studio Chojin and become a member of the Unholy Army of the Night. So with that said, this is Reverend Paul saying, until we meet again. <laughs>